All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Jag, and I'll be your MC today. Um, I would like to start by acknowledging the Ngunnawal people uh, as the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today, and to pay our respects to the elders, past, present, and future. Uh, thank you for <laughs> finding time to attend the first installment of the AI Talk series brought to you by Barry Jam and Seabrim. Uh, the intent of these talks is to raise awareness about uh, the field of AI, especially uh, making it accessible for non-experts and by bringing diverse speakers and participants. So it doesn't really matter if you are a novice in AI or an AI veteran like yourself, um, you are welcome and um, you are invited. A few housekeeping items before we begin. For those of you in the room, uh, questions will be taken towards the end of the session. And for those of us joining online, uh, please feel free to type in your uh, questions anytime in the chat prompt, and I will take them up towards the end of the session. Uh, if, however, due to time constraints, we are unable to um, go through all the questions, don't panic. We will answer them offline as well. Uh, we will also be publishing the recordings uh, of the session on the AI Talks page. Uh, so for anyone who couldn't join us today or had to leave, they have access to it afterwards. And um, so, yeah, just fully immerse yourself and engage. No need to take notes. So for our talk today, uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Avishbar Misra, uh, a leading AI expert who has invented and launched AI solutions across, used by millions of people around the globe every day. And uh, if you've ever shopped on Amazon, you get those recommendations. Well, the courtesy, courtesy Dr. Misra here. So blame him. Uh, <laughs> uh, Dr. Mishra is a former head of data science uh, at Trackphone Wireless, a Verizon company in the U.S., and has led data science practice for the Americas at Teradata. He has recommendation algorithm and Amazon, the one that I was just talking about, has been hailed as once in a decade leap. So big shoes. Uh, he also has built Amazon Go and launched ML self-service for Amazon advertising. He currently holds 10 patents and is the author of 13 research papers. Dr. Misra has a PhD in artificial intelligence from UNSW and is currently the CEO of Berry Jam, where he is making AI simple, accessible, and affordable for everyone. Avi, it is my pleasure to introduce you to our audience today, and we're all looking forward to hearing your insights on the future of AI. The floor is yours. Wonderful, and thank you, Jag. And hi, everyone. Welcome to the first AI talk, first in the series that we hope will become a monthly session. So second Wednesdays of every month are going to be AI talks, both in person here at Seabrin and ACT, but also remotely. And we've got some folks. Ruth, I know, is joining us from Seattle. Uh, Sophie, I'm not sure where you are, but and Eleanor, I think you're a local. Um, Sophie, would you mind t putting in chat where you're from or even coming off mute and saying hi? Yeah, hey, I'm Canberra-based, and so, so is Eleanor. Oh, you guys are local as well, sorry? Yeah, sure. Fantastic, excellent. So let's get into it. I, feel free to put in questions as we go. Um, today's the first time we're going to be doing this, and so there are going to be ideas and ways to make this better. Please don't hesitate. We have a very experimental philosophy. We keep trying new things and experimenting and learning from it, and you'll understand why as we go through the talk. Today, I thought what would be really good is to talk about some examples of what leads to success. And in particular, I'm going to talk about three domains that I have got personal experience building solutions for. The first is retail, you know, brick and mortar. Second is lumber production. The third one is movies and streaming content. And of course, what I'm going to share today is not going to be a deep dive into code. We're not going to be writing any code or solving any math equations. We're really going to look at the fundamentals of the culture and behaviors that lead to success, right? AI is very, very challenging um, as a domain itself, but trying to make it work in a product, trying to make it uh, work in a service even more so. So a lot of people's experiences with AI is, is sort of like they're looking for a, uh, they're like a blind man walking around in a dark room looking for a black cat that really might not even be there. And so that means they're very much searching and floundering without really a good direction or frameworks to work with, which makes it really, really challenging 
and more likely for failures and success. So what I'm going to share today are the secrets that I have learned over the years that have been very repeatable uh, support for maximizing the, uh, you know, the chance of success and reducing the risk that goes fundamentally in this space. Okay. So the first example I'm going to use and, and Jag mentioned was Amazon Go. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Amazon Go, Amazon Go is a physical retail store. Right, there are about 30 out of uh, these stores in US and UK. Uh, I was part of the team, an amazing team of very, very smart and talented people who made this work from the sense of a prototype and get down to production and, and launch multiple stores. It's amazing. Um, and the whole premise behind the Amazon store is. They are just in Are they? Online? Yeah. Uh, let me just double check. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we didn't get any notification. Okay, her name is Sarah. Sarah. I just see what, is this on Teams or? No, it's on it's the unlocked room, so she should really just speak. join. Yeah, yeah, it's unlocked. She's probably on the screen where it's like, accept like permissions for video and. Online. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's on. Web, Web Webby. Webby. Okay, and how did you, how do you get the link? Is that on the? That's in the invite, but you can send um, berryjam.whereby.com slash AI dash talks. Okay. <laughs> All right, so let's keep going. Hopefully they can join, but the room is unlocked and so they should be able to add. Um, there we go. So the basic premise behind the store was to help eliminate one of the biggest pain points customers face. Believe it or not, it's at the checkout waiting, just waiting in line. And while you're waiting, you've got the poor checkout person working feverishly, trying to scan every item and pack it, but also make small talk and get engaged and engage you and say, hey, did you, did you remember to pick up this item? And when you're in that checkout, and if someone does prompt you for that item, you really are not gonna say, oh, wait, hold on. I forgot the milk, just keep your gro the groceries here, I'll go fetch the milk and then we'll continue the checkout, which is a lost sale for a lot of, lot of retailers. It is also a bad experience. We spend how many hours, and I'm sure someone, um, you know, you would have all experienced a situation where you've seen the checkout lines are so long and they said, oh, screw it, we'll just come back another time, right? It has happened, which means from a business perspective, it's a lost revenue, it is a poor customer experience. And the whole concept was to try and eliminate that waiting by creating a very seamless experience as you walk in and you shop and you walk out. So you start off, start off by coming in with your phone and you use a QR code to scan as the turnstiles and you as enter the store. And then you put the phone away and you walk around, and you pick up items from the shelf and what you don't want, you can put it back and then you just keep shopping and shop and shop and shop. And then as you're done, you walk out. And as you walk out, you get essentially an automatic receipt checkout for all the items you picked up off the, off the shelf, right? So you get that shopping um, experience, which is very, very simple and magical for the end user. You've eliminated a major bottleneck for them to shop and spend time on. But the complex, uh, uh, so the complex process in all of this is the technology to track people in the store uh, to find out who this person is and what items are they picking up? What are they shopping for, right? Um, and what are they putting back? Now you're dealing with multiple people in the store. You're dealing with different lighting conditions. You're looking for shadows. You're looking for movement. You've got kids running around grabbing stuff off the shelf, for example. That's a particular, very, very difficult use case. But the whole idea is a very, very complex problem. And how do you solve it? So naturally, we had multiple teams tackling this issue. And my team and I were tasked with the very simple task of identify what items were picked, um, what items were returned back on the shelf, and the quantity and the combination of each of these selections. Right? Sounds simple enough. Right? Well-constrained problem, but a very, very messy to begin with. In fact, we had a tough time trying to get it working. Right? So I was involved with at least four to five working prototypes that did not make it. 
and we had other teams also working. And so every quarter we would try and take a technology, whether it was weight sensors, whether it's RFID chips, whether it is uh, pressure sensitive mats, whether it's cameras attached to the cart or the, 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 the basket or whatever it is, looking to see whether this was a feasible piece of technology that would get us there. So every quarter, we would build multiple prototypes. So each of those uh, crosses represents a prototype that did not make it. And so it wasn't just my team, there were multiple teams working in Palo, but each quarter, we would look at the results from the previous one and say, what did we learn? And feed into the design and exploration for the next quarter, right? And so you, if you think about it, you're spending about a month in review, you really only build something in two, two months. And you're doing it very, very quickly and rapidly to try and make the smallest feasible uh, concept to test out whether it'll work. Yeah. Right? Um, and we finally did get a solution, right? So after about a year of building this, we had one working prototype where you had a strip of cameras underneath the sh uh, shelf on the top looking down, and you had weight sensors in the shelf itself. And you had products lined up on, on the shelf, as you typically do. And as you'd enter, you'd use a combination of real-time image and video processing as you pick up items combined with the weight sensors and do sensor fusion to figure out, well, did we pick up two cans of Coke or um, a packet of rice or something else, right? And that we got to that sort of scenario with multiple iterations and multiple failures, right? So if you go to an organization and say, hey, I want to use AI to build a product, you've got to really think about, well, what is the process and steps you're going to take to prove this out or test this out very rapidly given the likelihood of failure along the way? Yeah. Make sense? And there's a bunch of patents. So what I'm sharing is all publicly available. All these are links to patents out there, so you can go check them out yourself. Right? So nothing, none of the proprietary information is sort of being shared in here. The so fundamental lesson from this, which is really at the heart of any of the high-risk AI innovations, is short iterations. You're not talking about one-year project. You're talking about quarterly projects. You're talking about very short dev test cycles. So when you're building an AI solution or a product, you really want to think about how quickly can I answer the most important question next? And then look at the results without ego. This is the hardest part to do for engineers and scientists because you have a lot of emotional ego vested in the solution. And you gotta, that's the tough part, convincing other scientists and engineers that their baby is ugly. It's not easy to do, right? But it is fundamental for success. So what you want to do is instead of looking at an AI solution for one year long project, you want to look at it quarterly and you want to look at monthly and so you want to get down to... Um, Jack, can you unmute yourself? Uh, could somebody who's got us mute yourself? Can you unmute yourself? Mute yourself. Thank you, Seamus. Um, okay, fantastic. All right, so the goal is to really look at short iteration cycles, okay? You answer the most important question that you can in the next two weeks, next month, test it out and form the next round of experimentations you're gonna do, okay? Now let's look at the next one. Next domain, we look at lumber production. Can we go down to this comment? Uh, so with the retail, especially in um, this grocery shopping area, uh, the standard stores, if I can call them that, the positioning on a shelf determines the price that the wholesaler is going to pay to have their product on a shelf. In other words, if you want to be at eye level, mm -hmm. you're going to, it's a premium position compared to being on the very bottom or being on the top. So did you guys um, monetize the experience where you can show that particular products in particular places mm -hmm. represented a particular value to the supplier? Let, let me repeat the question for everyone joining remotely. The question really from James is to say, hey, just sorry, John, is um, when you have a retail store, 
products are priced at different stages and stacked differently on the shelves. And is there a way, an opportunity to do something with that sort of price from the manufacturing and retail and stuff? We really didn't look at that. We, our focus more was more on getting the technology to work around it so that we could empower the retail store managers and professionals to do that kind of decision making. So in a particular retail store, you have what is known as a planogram where they figure out what product goes on which shelf and which location. And that, you know, having that information and now the ability to track people and see are they spending time and picking up items off the shelf, that's an opportunity to optimize that. That really is a fantastic use case. Another potential use case is couponing as you're shopping around, right? You you get a prompt for saying, hey, you've you've picked up pasta the sauce and some some spaghetti. It looks like you're making some pasta. Here's a bottle of red that goes well with it. Do you want to pick it up on your before you head to checkout, right? So so there are multiple opportunities that open up. But in this specific use case or what we were developing, we're working on that that sort of magical shopping experience. How we how stores use it depends. Very right? okay. Awesome. How you doing? Sorry, sorry, I came a bit late. No worries. So, I, uh, in a previous life, I worked for a beverage company, and the planograms and like the, the amount of time like, getting plate shelf placement in specific areas was so incredibly valuable. I imagine that supermarkets would be fascinated by um, how long it's X customer spending in X category, um, which is then valuable to marketers and everyone. There's lots, lots of possible options there. Like, but my, my personal uh, preference, the biggest pet peeve I've got right now is the checkouts at Coles and Woolies. The self-checkout is terrible. It constantly breaks down. It's a horrible shopping experience, and it really does nothing to improve the customer experience value for it. And so what you're doing is you're basically annoying your customers, and they're trying to minimize the time they spend shopping, right? which is a very, very bad experience. Um, but let's let's hold off some questions uh, right towards the end. Let's come back to some of this stuff. All good. Let's talk about another use case, right? So we went from retail, Amazon retailer. And let's talk about another use case on in the domain of lumber production, right? And this generalizes for any any you know you know lumber mining construction. When you those spaces where you're making or mining things out of the ground or producing for agriculture perspectives as well, right? Um, so this particular lumber producer in North America were interested in predicting the price of lumber in the next week. Because if they could do that, they could make one of three decisions. The first was to either hold on to the inventory and say, hey, look, the price is going to be up next week. Well, I'll sell it then rather than now. Or they could sell it because they think the price is going to go down next week, so they're better off getting a better deal this week or to ship it offshore to another market that is actually the much better price compared to what we can expect, right? So a lot of simple, you know, simple price prediction unlocks these very simple business decision support mechanisms where you can sort of optimize and look at arbitrage as a way to make, maximize profits. Uh, even a small improvement would have translated to 20 to $25 million over three years. That's a massive improvement. I'm mean, being very conservative about that potential benefit, right? So when you're dealing in large volumes, even 1% or 10% can map up very, very quickly. And if you've got a system which had no AI capabilities and you're adding new capabilities to or machine learning capability to improve the decision making, you can see orders of uh, 3x improvements in some cases, right? So, so there's a very, very good use case there. Now, this particular organization, they already had an analyst. They already had someone with 10, 15 years of experience. They knew their market really well. They read all the industry reports, and they had a machine learning model that would predict the price of lumber next week. Fantastic. How would, how would Avi and his team come in, and then come in and suddenly solve this and make this better? And so I didn't know the domain, but I, and I didn't have the expertise or the history so the way to tackle this problem was to do a lot of experiments. In fact, thousands of experiments. Each of these dots that you see represents the performance of one machine learning model predictor. And this image shows about 17,472 models that were built and tested. And another, there was another one that another experiment ran 
20, with 22,000 all up, we explored nearly 40,000 machine learning models. So when someone says, oh, I built a machine learning model, that's wonderful, uh, that's great, that's the first step. Now, how do you scale it to something like 40, 50,000 models or variants of it? Because it gets you a model that is perhaps better than what you have. So just so I understand, so basically every pink dot is a different decision tree algorithm. Yes. That's right. Okay. Each pink dot is a different decision tree algorithm, which was trained for the data for that particular month, that particular week, uh, going backwards in time from 2015 to 2017. Yeah, so you basically put them all through the same data set, and mm -hmm. then you can tell which one was a better predictor. Yeah, because you learn which algorithm is consistently performing well over different times different time periods, because when you're making a prediction, you won't have the, all the information for the future. You'll only have the historical data. So if I have an algorithm that I've trained using data from 2015, is the same algorithm stable enough to make a prediction yeah. subsequent week and so forth and so forth? All right, make sense? Mm -hmm. So the question is, all right, we did, we did this as a 40,000 model search. Did we get anything, anything good or not? And so best way to visualize it is, is this way. All models are going to make mistakes, right? What you want to see is, is the mistakes within the ranges that you are, it's okay to accept. So we had a tolerance of plus and, five per, uh, plus and minus 5% of the actual price for the subsequent week. So you see this sort of, um, the box, so you have the zero, and so you have the plus 5%, minus 5% of that price. And what you see is the distribution of the predictions under that that point, right? So if you've got a lot of predictions that were more than 20% out, they would add up here. If you had a lot of predictions that were 5% out, they would be under this point, right? And because we're taking an aggregate performance across multiple models, multiple versions, you get to see an overall stable performance under the statistical distribution sort of thing. And so we had the blue algorithm, which was the algorithm they already had, which you know trained by an expert, which was in the target zone, this sort of black area, this black box, 40% uh, of the time. So 40% of the time, their algorithm was doing really well within the plus five, uh, plus minus five percent of the prediction predicted price. The new algorithm that we found was in the target zone 73% of the time. That's a 1.8 times improvement, right? That's a pretty sizable improvement. If you can improve your prediction capability, you are nearly two times better at monetizing and making smarter and better decisions. Your decision making improves. Did you test this against the humans that were already doing it by hand? That's the blue algorithm. Oh, I, no, that's the blue algorithm that would feed into their decision making. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But in terms of, look. Do you know what I mean? Were, were people doing the 60% before mm -hmm. this algorithm? Or? It's a good question. So, for the benefit of everybody else, the question is did we test this against? Uh, humans um, no they were not set up to do that because the humans analysts would take the information from the model and then they would write a report and generate and may share it with others so they, that organization really wasn't suited for that sort of that sort of experiment but it's a good experiment to do in medical domain where you have radiologists and experts interpreting medical scans there's often the algorithms tend to outperform humans um, very very often these days yeah yeah. Well, that makes sense because it's less about, it's more about spotting something difficult to spot, whereas mm -hmm. this is more, um, I don't know, there's a lot of factors going into predicting price. But yeah. but actually, they're fairly controlled. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not an infinite number of variables. There's only... Well, you the variables that we used were, you know, the previous trailing weeks or months of the price, the type of lumber it is, the what is happening in terms of climate, in terms of yeah, weather so conditions, market, conditions, market well. conditions. So those were the inputs going into the model. Yeah, there's probably not that many of those inputs. That's yeah. Sure. I, I don't remember what I'm talking ahead, but yeah. we would generally, look, we've been in situations where we were doing so advertising in other spaces. We, we were looking at 1.7 to 2.1 million features to start off with before we get down to the top 100 yeah. features or I, top I, 10 features. Yeah, maybe, I don't want to get off topic, but it's interesting to understand what the constraints are, right? Like I mm -hmm. just read something the other day that Facebook is saying they're making one of trillion variables and then somebody rightly asked, why mm -hmm. do you need a trillion? But maybe we can talk about that. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk about it in, in this, hold that thought because yeah. I'll come back to what features would we try later on, okay? 
Um, so what was the lesson out of this particular scenario? If you were to ground it, basically you've got to look at ways to scale the number of experiments you do, right? Because each model represents one experiment. And if you only ever did one experiment or maybe 10 experiments, you, your, your understanding of the space is limited. So in the previous lesson, we talked about shorter experimentation cycles because you're learning. Here we're talking about scale the number of experiments you do. So that's, that's very, very important. Yeah, so like, how did you get 40,000? That's a lot. Yeah. So what did you build something first in order to automate that? Or so how did you do 40,000 models? I guess. So the question is, how do we get to 40,000 models? We looked at all the standard, state-of-the-art, open source uh, predicting models. We looked at different combinations of time periods, and we looked at different combinations of feature engineering. The way you generate features, the way you prepare the data, the way you train the models, the algorithms, and their hyperparameters. So you can come up very easily explored. You know, we're. So we run it all of it in parallel, basically, on that's the same data set. Yeah, we exp uh, you explore it in parallel using, you know, d uh, distributed computing. Okay. All right. I get it now. Yeah, makes yeah. sense. Excellent. Good question. So now let's move to movies and TVs. Everybody likes movies and TVs and Netflix and, and Amazon Prime, you know, if you've got that streaming service. And the question is, you're sitting on a Friday night, you kind of, you've had a tough week, you, what do you want to watch? Do you watch Up or do you watch Deadpool, right? Very, very simple, simple decision, but we spend too much time trying to figure out what to watch. And if you can improve that, you know, improve the customer experience, they, they see the value of the service, and they have a better time, right? They spend better, spend more with you. Now, I'm going to give you a crash course in neural networks. Don't worry, no math. It's very, very simple. Um, so the idea in, in neural networks is very simple. This is fundamental to everything from, you know, your speech recognition, image recognition, la large language models. This is basically the fundamental concept behind neural networks. So you start off with essentially nodes that were meant to represent human neurons connected with other nodes in the brain, right? So one feeds into the other, which feeds into the other, which feeds into the other. Mm -hmm. And so you have a layer of input nodes that are connected to layers that are hidden where in, internally, and then you have an output node. And each of these links either enhances the signal or suppresses the signal. Mm -hmm. And so as you add through this, what you have input on one node can translate into lighting up the output nodes in a different level of intensity. That's one way to think of it. So in movie recommendations or t product recommendation, which is very generic and, and, and used everywhere, you can basically say one node, if the person had watched Deadpool, they'll get a one on the input there. But if you, they hadn't seen Matrix or Up, they get a zero on the input. So you feed into the network ones and zeros on the inputs on different nodes and goes through this network and you recreate it on the other side. And you're training the, uh, the neural network to learn how to recreate what was the, on the input by, this is called um, backpropagation reinforcement learning techniques to improve the weights between the connectors. Now, when you recreate it, the recreation isn't perfect. You get noise in that. So for example, we had one as an input for Deadpool and recreation in this, this sort of made up example might be 0.98. And, but what you also get is other nodes that light up because what you're trying to do is you're forcing a very large number of input nodes through a very narrow pipe and then you're exploding it out again. And so what you're doing is you're forcing the neural network to learn how to compress the knowledge, the information and signal and recreate it. And when it does that, it basically is finding other things it's somewhat related to. It's a very, very simple, uh, interesting idea as a concept, right? So when you recreate it on the other end, what he's doing is getting noise of things that are related because the signal passes through, okay? Now, this is the typical formulation, what's known as an autoencoder. This is known as a typical matrix factorization in, in, in product recommendation. Have you ever heard of product recommendation? This is, this is pretty standard. So you put in all the, all the movies that went in and try to recreate on the other end. With me so far? Now, when you've got something like this, um, this, is, this makes perfect sense, right? The experts have been in this space for a long time. And when I joined the team, 
we'd already been looking at autoencoders and the issue that we were facing were we weren't doing any better than the existing statistical methods and methodologies to generate recommendations. Interesting. Right. Autoencoders, neural nets, really, really good. Supposed to be state of art. Everybody else is getting speech recognition. Everybody else is getting image recognition. Why isn't it working for movie recommendations? And so when I came in, I was not the expert in the domain of movie recommendations. Right? I'd done some of the other stuff, advertising and other places and medical domains. So I looked at the problem with a slightly different angle. I said, what if we basically said, okay, instead of trying to recreate the entire history, we will only try to predict what's the next movie the user would watch the next week. Right. So we would only input the information for the previous weeks or days that the, or history that the user has watched. And then on the output, expect the neural network to create the movie that the user would watch in the next week. You're forcing it to predict the future. You're not trying to tell it, recreate the past. Right. And so this is not a very fancy name. I just came up with neural network classifier. It was, a, it was a very contentious sort of discussion around whether we should do it or not. And we ended up going and saying, OK, let's, let's try it out. Let's see if it works. Right? In fact, it worked really well. So the blue line represents the, the performance metrics. So higher up, the better. The blue line represents the autoencoder uh, performance for precision and for recall. And I'll talk a little bit about what they mean. And you can, and the red line represents the ones from neural networks. Precision and recall are the two standard metrics in machine learning that typically use to test the quality of a model, aggregated over lots of examples. So in movie recommendations or product recommendations, you look at not just the top recommendation, you also look at the top six recommendations, and you say, hey, if I was to show six products out of that, what was the, the precision or recall of the model? in recommending a movie that someone actually ended up watching. And you know, it's not just one person. You do it across thousands, if not millions, of potential customers or users of it. Make sense? Question? Yeah, how accurate it will be? How? How accurate it will be, the, for example, the suggestion for the next week movie? So the question is how accurate it is. So this essentially, when, when we measure accuracy, we look, at, uh, we look at it in terms of precision and recall are two metrics. Accuracy itself isn't a very good metric. You know, I could basically not make a lot of predictions and I'd say I'm very accurate, but I'm missing out 90% of the customers who I have made no recommendations for. So which is a poor way to say it. So the way that we look at precision recall, precision is basically saying of the people I did make a recommendation for, what percentage did I get it right? They actually watch the movie next week. And recall measures of all the people that watch the movies, what percentage did I actually recommend correctly for? Did I miss people? So in, this is also known as type one and type two errors, right? In machine learning, they'd be sort of balancing out. Because if I could be very, very greedy and selfish and say, like, I'll only just make a prediction for Matt because I know Matt really well. And I'm very confident about his prediction. Wow, my model's performing at 100%. But I'm missing out everybody else's predictions. So accuracy in machine learning isn't, is, is not really a good way to a loan metric. You want to look at it in terms of the context of the problem you're trying to solve. Now, when you look at precision values and you say, oh, it's only 5% or 7%, it looks ridiculously low, right? When you're doing a coin toss, like, really? Is this good? But now let's look at it this way. When you're doing a, a, a coin toss, there's a 50-50 chance of getting it right or wrong, heads or tails, right? So at that point, you better be doing better than 0.5 or 50% of meta, right? If you want to be able to predict what's happening next. When you start work moving into the world of movie recommendations or product recommendations, you're no longer just making deciding between two products or two outcomes. You're deciding from thousands, if not millions of products and items. Right, so randomly picking one of the movies out of a thousand movies, your precision value is going to be less than 0.1, right? It's a big deal. It's a big deal. And so the scale of the precision recall value really depends on the context in which you're measuring them, right? And so the blue line, the autoencoder, versus the red line, we see a dramatic lift. And this is published in a paper and the team wrote after it left, but you know, nice to include me. Um, you're free to go check it out. It really walks through 
how the formulation is so dramatic a change that it made from movies to TVs to products like uh, clothing and items on Amazon improving it. In fact, it was such a big deal that Jeff Wilkie, the CEO of Amazon's consumer division worldwide at the time, um, called it out during his keynote as once in a decade leap in recommendations at Amazon, right? Now, it's, a ma it's the same thing. It's massive, and you can go watch the, watch the keynote. He'll, give, he'll walk through the same sort of uh, formulation. But what was so interesting here? It wasn't that I was any brilliant genius here, you know, who's figured out a way to make this better. No, the difference was I was looking at the problem from a very different perspective. I was not a domain expert. I did not know recommendations really well. So I was looking at it with completely novices, fresh eyes. And so I was asking what appeared to be dumb and stupid questions. And one of those dumb and stupid questions was basically challenging some of the assumptions that we had made in how we model movie recommendation, product recommendations, and collaborative filtering. And so one of the really, really good secrets to success is not to rely overly on experts because there are not enough experts and experts are guided by limited by their particular domain expertise. You really want to include very novel and diverse perspectives when you're trying to solve for that problem. Right? You want to get as you want to get the people in the front line of your business who understand the customer, who are interacting with day to day. What ideas do they have? What are the problems worth solving? You want to talk to the people, like get a 10-year-old or a 15-year-old to look at that problem and say, what ideas do they have? Right? And get diverse perspective to, to spark inspiration. Right? So very, very important. So novelty and diverse perspective sometimes can unlock gems that, are, that you wouldn't have thought of. It's very interesting because the actual AI world itself mm -hmm. lacks both of those things in, at the moment, mm -hmm. right? Which is unne unnecessarily constraining its you're, advance. You're spot on. And, and, and so the question for everybody is essentially, like the world of AI seems less diverse and very, very concentrated in the space of experts. And this is the perfect time for me to give you a pitch about Berry Jam because the whole point around Berry Jam and why we formed it is to make AI so simple and accessible that we value and welcome more diverse and novel perspectives. Our goal is to make it as broad and easy to ad uh, adopt and incorporate as possible so we get more. So you don't have to go and get a PhD just to do this. Well, I was even also referring more to the data sets that are being used. Mm -hmm. which, you know, sort of the what stuff, what you were getting at was like sort of the people end of it, that it shouldn't take a PhD in order to be able to leverage things. Mm -hmm. Then you also have the bias in the modelers themselves. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, we've got the moment, there's not really a good, you know, everybody's sort of scrambling and scraped together a data set. Um, so the data sets themselves are constraining mm -hmm. the advancement of the, mo of the intelligence. So but, and I think the it, model to go the leap, leaps and bounds because basically it's a math problem, right? But the data set problem is more mm -hmm. of a yep, yep. industrial process of collecting data in some kind of more accurate or just a better way than let's just I don't know let it learn off the internet. God forbid. So, so great point, and just for benefit of others, Zeus raised an important point. It's almost like she's seen my slides of about the next topic. <laughs> which is around things to be cautious about, right? One of the very, very important things to worry about is around data and nature of things. Uh, but I'm going to give you, you know, a very, very concrete, simple example to really ground it, right? So when you go, I, I spent 12 years in the U.S. and, you know, when every few years we would have to go and go through the visa process and, you know, do a lot of paperwork and, and take up photos and screenshot, uh, screen photos and, and submit them. And they were getting better over the 12 years, right? You know, it got to a stage where they had this amazing new application that would automatically analyze my, my mugshot, my photo, and say, all right, this is good. Go through the next step and streamline the process. The intent was perfect, right? It was great. It's supposed to help. Now, I'm going to show you two photos and to, so you can see if you can tell me any, what's the difference between these two photos? Anyone can shout out and see if there's anyone who's got anything in chat. What's that? So one of the ones is brighter. Which one? Yeah. 
So the person stock on the left. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, color. Okay, so color is slightly different between the two. Okay. Believe it or not, one of these photos was rejected by the system. Which one? Do you think the last one? Uh -huh. Which one you say that? Which, which one? Yeah, which one? So let's do this this guy or uh, where the mouse is. Did this guy get rejected? I was rejected. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so so you know, John definitely doesn't uh, does not want me in the country. Yeah. So so we've got this option, and then we've got the other option. In reality, it was the one on the left that got rejected. And all I did was change enhance the contrast on the photo and it passed automatically. Right? So what changed? Making it make me making me look a slightly brighter made the system work. What does it tell you? It tells you the system that they had designed was trained on badly biased uh, data sets. Mm -hmm. Right, that meant that they'd collected some data, they didn't hadn't, hadn't considered that there'd be people like me in the world, and you know this algorithm was badly trained. And this is. Why they say you shouldn't smile on a, on a photo for passport because they've got a particular um, some sort of an algorithm that's running. They have to see your eyes. So when you smile, like you know, you can see some eyes, yeah. but generally for the software to work, they have to actually see the you know as much of your eye, but that's how they, the, the face recognition works. It's not just uh, um, uh, the software, it's also the humans. The humans. Right, so you know, there's a the, the standard for passport photos has been around way before AI algorithms were being used for sorting those AI, uh, those passport photos. And so, so some of these things, you know, one side of it is well, what type of photo is relevant. So that's, that's, that's something else, right? But the key thing to think about is when you're building these systems, what is the data you're using to train these systems? Right. So to Sue's earlier point, right, you just grab data from the internet is going to be biased or or you know highly distorted in some ways. Yeah, it's possible, and that's why you can't always trust the data you found and find on the internet. Your organization's data is your specific organization's characteristics. I cannot go to calls and say, "Give us your data," and I'll use that data to predict Woolies' behaviors. No, there are different domain sources. But, but so when you say bad, bad data, like at, at some point, right? Like this, this is going to need to. It's going to need to be cut off because the photo is too dark, mm -hmm. or like, it's, or you can't see it. Mm -hmm. What, what, like, what determines if, if, if like, when does it become bad, bad data? Like, is there is that like considering like the margin of error of the the the, uh, of the system? So good question. Uh, sorry, what's your name again? Jack. Jack has asked a question. When do when does the data become bad? Like at what point? Right? How would you in this image domain spe uh, specifically? How would you decide if it's a good image or a bad image? The way to think about it is look at the distribution of the population that you will be catering to, and do are they well represented or not? Right? Isn't you know? And it's not just about taking the average, right? What you uh, design thinking has this principle of designing for the extreme edge cases. Because if you design for the darkest person or the lightest person, then you will cover everyone in the gamut, so to speak, right? So it's less about is there an objective measure. You've got to look at it in the context. Now, if you take the same concept, right, you've got collecting data which is extremely biased from, hey, if it was only, um, you know, a particular uh, you know, phenotype or a genetic type of people whose photos were taken and used in the system, it's going to fail. One of the famous examples was self-driving cars were missing black people in America on the roads because it was didn't have enough data to represent in the training data. It just reminded me of the Facebook, the Facebook uh, when they first launched the, the, the face match, mm -hmm. and there was an issue with with the, the different uh, well, with black people essentially not getting enough coverage. Another example would be um, car stack data. So uh, most of women are highly un underrepresented in um, heart attack medicines and in general research as such. So while we know that, oh, if your left arm is hurting, you will probably have, you're probably having a coronary. But for women, that is not how, not how it works. It's essentially, they get, it's a bit, very different characteristics of uh, women getting heart attacks. So 
Same goes with oncology data and all of these things. So in oncology, most of the, the, the data set is essentially um, in the developed nations and not essentially in, let's say, Africa or uh, Asia. Yeah. So um, the medicines are, are only essentially just cater to those uh, demographics and stuff. So. All right, let's, let's keep going quickly. Um, so we're not too far off. Quick summary, short iterations, to answer the most important question is next. Uh, review it regularly without ego. Scale the number of experiments. Uh, bring in novel and diverse perspectives because you're building solutions that are you're only looking from your perspective. You want to get other people involved. And be very careful about the data you're using to train your system. Biased data means biased algorithms, which means you're going to lead to bad decisions, right? There's a lot of grief that you can sort of bring into the pair.